Thank you. I assume every, I assume you can hear me. Coming through loud and clear here in the auditorium. Good. So my name is James Robnett. I'm with the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, um, NRAO. I'm going to talk about the next generation BLA. Um, Dean Wilcox talked about it yesterday. There's an awful lot of overlap with my slides, so I will probably skip through those relatively quickly. Um, so the uh, we currently operate an instrument called the, the Jansky Very Large Array, or the BLA. Uh, Carl named after Carl Jansky. Uh, people have seen the movie Contact, or other movies may be familiar with with it visually. Um, it's a 27 dish interferometer. Um, each antenna generates about 100 gigabits per second. Um, all of those signals come back to a central processing uh, system that, that has an output rate of about 20 megabytes per second or so, 200 megabit. Um, this instrument's been in existence for 50 ish years. Um, and the NGVLA is a proposal to replace it with, with the next generation. Uh, we're not very good at naming things. Um, any, any more than, than CHTC is. Um, that instrument exists in, in sort of central New Mexico, west central New Mexico. This, this here is I-25, Albuquerque's up here, El Paso's down here somewhere. These are two very small towns, and so the instrument is out here. Um, the new instrument um, is going to be rough closer to 300 or 263 um, and then there will be some others, uh, 263 antennas. These will be 18 meter antennas, whereas the existing ones are 25 meters. They'll be centered at roughly the same location, um, um, but with a much longer arms. Um, the current uh, JBLA has arms that are in the you know, 10 to 20 kilometer range. This will be in the hundreds of kilometers range. And so here's a map and you can see the scale. Here's the US. Here is roughly the center, and there will be these spiral arms rotating out into Texas, Arizona, um, and, and Mexico. Um, here are two other images. These are approximate locations. Uh, we have not begun placing them. Um, I'm seeing admit requests, so I'm clicking on them as I speak. I don't know if I'm supposed to be seeing those, but I'm admitting people to the Zoom room. Um, it's interesting, Frank's talk about OSDF, um, and he was drawing circles. If you look at his blank spot, it's basically right here. Um, and that's not, it's coincidental, but only sort of. Uh, we've intentionally placed the VLA and the NGVLA in a very low density population area. Um, and so you miss these higher density where the, where the high throughput bandwidths are. Um, there will be a lot of fiber optics running. So there, all of these antennas, uh, this will be a central core. The density decreases as the further we get from the core. So the highest density of antennas will be in this core within 30 kilometers or so of the, of the, of the center. Um, each antenna will have, this says 400 to 800, but I think this is dated. I think they'll basically be 400 gigabit links um, back to um, a central location. There'll be some, at least 200 gigabit link, and it will probably be multiple two, two to 300 gigabit links to carry data away from here. So data comes back to the core, gets processed just to create our raw data. We then have to ship it out somewhere for the processing. So there'll be about 187 antennas here, another 30 in this area, and then there's another 25 that expand out um, um, across the US. Um, and roughly, you know, the, the title of this says near exascale, and then I say 60 petaflops, and that's nowhere near exascale. Um, and this is true. This is an average computing load um, that we would have to have um, to keep up with, with basically day-to-day -day observing. But there are one or two imaging cases that are at least an order of magnitude higher than this. So about 60 petaflop, 24-7, um, 365 days a year to, to keep up with the main imaging load. Um, that is, I don't know what picture that is. Oh, it's a two-phase, sorry about that. I was kind of surprised. So there are, um, for an instrument like this, when you propose it, you have to also include what your key science goals. What do you want to achieve by, with this instrument? And there are a number of key science goals for the instrument. Sort of the five bigger ones um, are looking in more detail at solar system um, formation. 
Uh, I think uh, Dean Wilcox had a slide on that. Um, probing, looking at, at initial planetary development, um, including looking for signatures, proteins, or others um, from astrochemistry of, of signatures of life, um, looking at galactic evolution, um, looking at pulsars and, and galactic center um, as a test along with LIGO for gravity, um, and, and looking at, at um, black holes. Um, we were just, there was just an announcement two weeks ago about um, finally imaging the black hole at the center of our galaxy. There was an image of a, gal of a black hole um, a while back, but that was um, in a different galaxy. Um, so these are sort of the key science goals. This one turns out to be the more hideous, one of the more hideous um, cases. This, this is very complicated, but we're going to try. Um, some years ago, NRAO operates along with um, ESO, NAOJ, um, an instrument, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. It's a, a, analogous to the VLA, but in the Southern Hemisphere in the Atacama Chilean Desert. Um, Crystal Brogan led a team that, that generated this picture, this image of HL Tau. This is a, um, a basically a star um, and a solar system forming. Right? The, the dusk is still accreting. Um, and it's kind of easy when people look at it, they look at this and they can see the analog. You know, maybe this is Mercury or Venus and this is Earth sweeping out and maybe this is some Jupiter Saturn pair or something. And you get an idea of, of some, what this might look like um, as you're doing planet forming. The problem is that's wrong. That, that's not right at all. The scale is misleading. Um, this is not the star. This is essentially the solar system that we would think of the solar system. This would encompass Jupiter, all the planets, Neptune might be out here. And so you can see this in the next slide that, that all of our planets are sort of in this area. This is much further out. Pluto would only be you know, here or so. Um, and ALMA operates at about the 100 gigahertz range. Um, EVLA will be in the 10 to, to 50 gigahertz range. And at this lower frequency and much higher sensitivity, we can actually peer into this area and begin to resolve actual planets and the star. So, so this fuzzy ball becomes an actual solar system um, in more detail. At least that's the, the plan. Um, we will also, uh, this is similar to a slide that Eric showed, um, be looking at building blocks um, in this 30 to 50,000 um, 30 to 50 gigahertz range, there are some, some key sugars, um, large compounds that we can detect, but to detect them requires fine spectral resolution. So in addition to spatial resolution to sort of peer into this um, solar system, we also need spectral resolution to differentiate um, these different compounds because you can't just say, oh, you know, glycine absorbs at this frequency because the, the solar system is going to be moving toward us or away from us. It's going to be blue or red shifted. And so we've got to be able to line these up and figure out, is this really a glycine absorption line? Um, so this is, this is the most complicated case for us in terms of imaging, because not only do we have large spatial um, resolution, um, but this added spectral resolution um, is a straight multiplier. Uh, we've got 30,000 channels are 30,000 times more complicated to image than a single channel um, in terms of, of flops. Um, so our imaging, um, the, our, imag our calibration, there's a calibration phase where, phase where we take our raw visibilities as they come off the correlator, our, our unique computer, um, that we, we the calibration step corrects for system errors and radio frequency interference, which I won't go into, but then once we have calibrated data, we need to image it. And we will have this calibrated data that sits sort of here. Um, these will be petabyte class data sets. Um, um, the way we do imaging is we have some model of the system response. What should the sky sort of look like if it was blank? Uh, what's, what's the system response of the instrument? We subtract that off, this gets a residual image. This is an irregular grid. It's a, it's a complex um, um, floating point of real and imaginary terms. Um, we grid them onto a regular grid um, that is in time and frequency space. There's an inverse Fourier transform that puts it into spatial dimensions. Um, we then 
have what's a deconvolution, what we call the minor cycle, which is looking for um, these sorts of what are actual components, uh, somebody else there, um, and get back a model image of what we think we're looking at. We then do a Fourier transform, get back into this dimension, put this back to replace the model, subtract it from the raw data and repeat the whole process. And we do this repeatedly, uh, five to 10 times typically, although it, you could be, if you have a very um, uh, complex source, you're looking at say a nebula with lots of, of, of sources and lots of objects, and lots of structure, you may have to do 20 or 30 or 40 imaging cycles to, to try to slowly approach some sort of convergence. If you're looking at a very bright point source, this might only be one or 10. Um, the number of loops in here is a function of how many components there are, how many bright objects are there. And so two different data sets that have similar starting conditions could have one or two orders of magnitude more flops, you know, different in terms of number of flops. Um, what we spit out are these are four dimensional cubes. So they are a single plane image of say 16K pixels on a side, stacked by upwards of 32,000 channels, and then four of those across um, based on the number of polarizations, uh, left hand, right hand, circular polarizations. So you get these large hypercubes of data, and those are our images. Uh, we can also make continuum images where we collapse all the frequency space down into one. Um, the, actually I get into this next. So, so in terms of, of software and computing considerations. Um, we're pretty sure we can keep the raw visibilities. Um, um, we will also store the calibrated visibilities. Um, all of our data processing, there are some radio instruments that image in real time. Um, they cannot store their raw visibilities. Um, and so they have a, a real time pipeline um, that does calibration and imaging. Um, we, get, we can store our raw, which means that we we can do our imaging after the fact and scale up to do as, as good an imaging job as, as we can sort of afford. Um, our average data rate is gonna be something like eight gigabytes per second, um, although the correlator will be capable of 320. Um, so for a four hour observation, that gets you something like hundred terabytes, uh, which would require a few thousand cores um, at, you know, cores here is a kind of a uh, dimensionless, unit, but picture, say, a 12-core um, Intel Gold 6136 processor, something of that class. Um, the peak planned data rate, so that key science goal two, where we would be looking at um, indications of life, is closer to 200 gigabytes per second. Um, to image that in sort of, say, a month um, or two, and you need to do that so that, you know, doctoral students can finish their dissertations, you can't take a year or two to do this imaging. Um, you're going to need something like 750 petaflops. Um, and our error bars are still large. So one could claim that this could be an excess of, a, of an exaflop. Um, um, we don't have plans to do that initially. That may get pushed out till 2035 or 2040. Um, um, operationally, as, as Eric mentioned, as Dean Wilcott's mentioned, we will be um, generating what are what we call science ready data products. Um, historically, radio astronomy was a, was a process of, of black belt astronomers uh, beavering away and figuring this out for themselves and generating their own in images. But we need to actually have a pipeline to do this. The, the, the average person, even the non-average person will not be able to generate images for this. So from a total computing, um, calculations are something like, again, core is kind of a bad unit, but something like 2 billion cores, um, core hours, which is, um, pretty big. Um, this is dominated by uh, the spectral resolution and time resolution. Uh, the larger the, the footprint of this instrument is, the faster you have to integrate because the Earth's rotating um, and you get smearing. If you, if you try to integrate for five seconds on, on something this large, you get a lot of smearing. So we'll have to integrate it at fractions of a second. So we get a data set, we get a, a data element um, multiple times per second per pair of antennas. So it goes is, is roughly the square of the antennas per spectral resolution. So you get something like 50,000 integrations times 50,000 channels times 50,000 baselines. 
times four polarization. So it's something like 50,000 50, cubed um, visibilities, things to grid to image, of which there are roughly a thousand flops per visibility. So you get 50,000 cubes times a thousand sort of flops um, for the higher cases. Um, it's hard for me to believe my first CHD counter week was now four, four years ago. Uh, we've been working behind the scenes a bit with CHDC. We're certainly not a big user like other, other uh, you know, LIGO or LHC, um, but we worked on a distributed imaging um, algorithm um, that's been very useful. Um, we have a large sky survey that we're doing that is uh, imaging in three times, it, it, it covers the entire sky three times over the course of about six years, the 34,000 square degrees that are visible from the Northern Hemisphere. Um, some of the original validation we used using HD Clean on CHDC resources. So that was very useful um, as a demonstration. Um, internally, we're now using HD Condor, all of the pipelines for the VLA um, for um, either the VLAS sky survey or for PI. Um, observations for their calibration and imaging pipelines are all processed um, via HD Condor or will be soon. They should be by September. Um, so the HD Condor, this HD Clean um, imaging implementation that we generated um, is uses DAGs. So we have, we, we will take the, the visibilities, partition them up in some axes, whether it's time or spectral, um, partition them out. Um, uh, we will generate the point spread function, then we will do gridding, uh, um, test, um, we'll gather up the, the results of these, and then we enter that, that imaging loop that you saw before. So there'll be this major cycle, um, a scatter and a gather, and then the minor cycle. And then we test um, uh, the exit code. Uh, did it converge? So we actually have a wrapper like uh, Greg was talking about. Um, if it converges, then we exit. If it didn't converge, we fail that sub DAG and we just repeat it. So we have a loop here. Um, this works quite well. Um, just checking the time, trying to get all the way through here. We're also working on a GPU implementation. Um, this is not a very great slide. I apologize. Historically, GPUs were not a good fit for radio astronomy imaging. Um, the ION was, was, they just couldn't keep up. They, they didn't have enough memory for the images and there was just no way to get the, the data in. Um, the, the flop to IO uh, was, was too low. That's changed in just in the last few years. V100s are pretty useful. We only use um, probably 30% of the cores, but um, that's still better than say a dual 12 core processor machine. Um, for one reason, with 24 cores, we can actually only use 16 because we run out of memory. Um, and so this is sort of the number of seconds for one of the VLAS images it would take to do one imaging cycle. Um, and this gridding is, is the, the largest component. With the GPU on a V100 single threaded, um, we can see we've collapsed this gridding time. And then there's these other components that also are sort of done inside the GPU. This model portion is serial and, and it doesn't get any benefit multi-threaded so that we have asynchronous IO into the GPU so that we process while, while one set of visibilities is being processed, we're loading the other. You see, we cut this again in half. And at this point, Ambal's law has kicked in and, and we're essentially saturated. We can't get any faster. Um, the good news is this is a very small data set. This is only about 10 gigabytes worth of data. Um, as the number of input visibilities goes up, so say a terabyte, this is the portion that's dominated by the number of visibilities. This portion is dominated by the number of pixels. Um, and NGVLA is not going to have substantially more pixels. Um, let's see, this is our gridding. Uh, we're about out of time. Um, this is our MPI. Our, our current parallel approach is an MPI based approach, and it doesn't scale. Uh, this is, we're going to have to scale. 10 to the third to 10 to the fourth way parallelization to make these images in, the, in a reasonable time. And this sort of approach won't work, plus the memory footprint in a node scales with the parallelization breadth. This is the parallel approach where you have essentially a single serial gridder and the parallelization occurs in the GPU. So last slide, um, our future um, with HTC, I absolutely think there is one. I, I think um, HTC will be critical to the GBLA's uh, success. We're an LHC scale problem. 
Uh, we're planning for a multi-tier distributed model, distributed model, uh, distributing to different data centers, but then within a data center, we have to tailor to the processing type. Um, and I'm out of time. So anyway, we're hiring. Uh, so that's it. Any questions?